The following interview was conducted with Dennis R. DePew, the Dean of the School of Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on uh, December the 3rd, 2008 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Welcome, Catherine. D One D correction. What? It's College of Technology. College of Technology. You're like me. We're st I'm still, from time to time, I still want to say schools of engineering or, or school of liberal arts. And, well, and, uh, well, Brian, we'll have to catch you clerk that, right? College? <laughs> yeah. We, why don't we start over? College. That's, oh, that's okay. That's great. Sorry. Thank you. All right, Rob, are we still rolling? Okay, ready? Okay. All right. The following interview was conducted with Dennis R. DePew, Dean of the College of Technology for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on December the 3rd, 2008 in the Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a bit about mm -hmm. where you were born and your parents and early years. Okay. Um, well, I'm a Southerner. I was born in a small town in the Appalachian Mountains of East Tennessee. The name of the town is Elizabethton. Population of maybe 40,000 people. Um, I grew up in East Tennessee and uh, there in that small town and well, tell us about uh, early school year and also high yeah, school. Yeah, like? elementary school there, yeah. um, and went to Elizabethan High School. Uh, I was um, very fortunate in that um, in my uh, sixth grade year, this was just shortly after Sputnik and the space program, uh, I was, um, along with a group of other youngsters, identified as an individual with... Uh, uh, some math aptitude, and uh, which uh, uh, gift, fate, whatever, was very fortunate because it tracked me in the early 60s into some accelerated math in the 7th and 8th grade, which served me well into high school. And uh, um, I graduated from Elizabethan High School in 1968. What activities, if any, in school? What was school and uh, athletics and activities? No, I wasn't much okay. of an athlete. Okay. Um, Did you go to some of the events? Oh, oh yeah, 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 very much. A, uh, but I'm a, a little guy, so football certainly wasn't going to be my forte. Sure. Um, the uh, played tennis, but not uh, in high school. But I was a tennis player, uh, loved baseball, but again, didn't play baseball in high school. Sure. Uh, but um, uh, but certainly was always a. Uh, a fine spectator and right uh, cheer them on right oh yes, yes right yes. was school far from where you lived not no. far actually okay. uh, both high school and elementary school were within walking distance so I grew up in t in a in in a the town area and so it was a very small town and and was easy to walk back and forth to school and it was probably oh late in my uh, high school career that uh, you know, bus service was provided, but even with bus service, it was Super. still an easy walk to, yeah. to school. Very nice. And then what, uh, what about college? After high school, what came next? After high school, what came next was um, not sure what I wanted to do with my life. And in 1968, you know what was happening uh, worldwide with the Vietnam War and the conflict. I enlisted in the Marine Corps, Tennessee volunteer. Um, every male family member going all the way back to the Battle of Kings Mountain had served in the military and I felt that uh, that was my calling and uh, so I enlisted in the Marine Corps Okay. and uh, uh, went through my training and uh, part of 1968 uh, part of 1969 and then uh, all most of 1969 and uh, part of 1970 I spent in the 5th Marines in South Vietnam. And um, when I finished my tour of duty and finished my tour in the Marine Corps, I came home and like a lot of GIs that when they finished their military career in, at the end of World War II or the Korean War, sure. uh, came back and went to college on the infamous or famous uh, GI Bill. And so um, when I came home, uh, that's how I attended undergraduate school. You went to uh, East Tennessee East State? East Tennessee State right. University. How did you have to select that? Was that very close? Oh, or? good question. Okay. Um, probably for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> One, it was very close by. Uh, East Tennessee State University is one of the regional campuses in the uh, Tennessee system of higher education. 
had a great reputation, um, small, about 7,000 students at the time, and uh, which suited me more than a large place with 30 or 40,000 students. And, um, and they had some programs there that I was very interested in at the time. So, mm -hmm. um, seemed that, to work out. That it did. Yeah. What was college like? Did you live on campus? I did uh, not. Okay. I was a commuter. At the time, East Tennessee State University was primarily a commuter university. Okay. They had residence halls, but it was not at all uncommon for students to commute back and forth. Sure, and right. That's, okay. Uh, and what was your uh, what was the campus like? Uh, their activities and any yeah, professors? Yeah, we had football and sure. uh, fraternities and sororities and a campus life and uh, um, uh, certainly athletics and. Um, did you become were you a member of fraternity? I did not. Okay. Um, I did not pledge a fraternity, um, and for a couple of reasons. One, um, actually, the major reason I didn't pledge a fraternity is when I came home from the service and when I was going to college, I married Donna. Okay. Oh, and, you, did uh, you meet her at school? We met. Oh, right. Yeah. And uh, Donna was um, uh, my wife, uh, was my high school sweetheart, and uh, took her to the senior prom, and I joke that she's kept me all of these years, and. Um, so when I came home, we she's got married. She stayed. Oh, you weren't married while you were in the service. No, oh, okay. no. We came home. I came home. We got married. Both attended East Tennessee State University together, and so. Um, oh, that was nice. Uh, it was, and um, so being married, fraternities just at that time wasn't right. a, wasn't a good fit, and of course, um, being married, it does change the dynamics of your focus on studies, your focus on, you know. What you do in the community right. and so forth. Right. Now, after you finished there, what uh, tell us what came what, now? Your graduate education, or what came after you got your undergrad? After my undergraduate degree, um, I worked um, in the construction industry for three or four years, and then I actually went back and began working on my master's degree. Uh, probably was it the late seventies, early eighties, and at the time I was working on my master's degree, I had a chance to do some teaching at a local community college. That was my first, I guess what you would say, experience in higher education and um, really enjoyed it. Uh, enjoyed being in the classroom, enjoyed interacting with, with students. Working with students, right. And about the time I was finishing my master's degree um, and doing Was this some, at East Tennessee? Is that where you were doing yes, it? Yes, I okay. did the master's degree there as well. I gave some thought about going on and working on a Ph.D. and. Uh, my faculty advisors uh, at East Tennessee State University said, uh, get out of the state of Tennessee. You have two degrees from here. Um, go somewhere else and earn a Ph.D. and maybe come back to East Tennessee State University someday as a faculty member, which never ever worked out. But um, the, um, We looked around uh, in the early 80s at uh, graduate degree programs and um, uh, looked at Northwestern University Texas A&M, Ohio State University, and looked at Purdue. And uh, Donna and I drove up to Purdue, and I'll always remember, <clears throat> had never been here before, and uh, we drove up and uh, we actually stayed in the, the Union. And this was um, before they did the big major remodeling of the Sure, when they, the, there were the desk and all, before the Union Club was. Exactly. And it was in May, and it was the semester was winding down, but the campus was in full bloom, and the weather was nice, and uh, people were very friendly. Uh, I discovered that uh, Purdue was a very friendly place and a place where faculty and staff really worked hard to try to help you find answers to your questions, and, and very quickly became sold on Purdue for a couple of reasons. One, academic programs. Um, two was flexibility. Uh, Purdue was a place that would allow you to develop a plan of study around uh, your interest and what you wanted to study rather than some prescribed, you know, lockstep curriculum. So you could venture over into engineering, you could venture over into science or in education, you could put together a plan of study that made some sense for you. That wasn't true at some of the other places. Secondly, Purdue offered Dennis and Donna a fellowship, which, as you well know, that's pretty important if you're going to right. finance a, an endeavor like right. a Ph.D. program. 
And then number three, we just really, it, it was a small community. You know, Purdue, um, West Lafayette, it's not a big bustling place like UT Knoxville. And right. uh, it, it, it was, it felt comfortable. And academically it felt comfortable and the community felt comfortable. And went back and told my faculty advisors at East Tennessee State University that I was considering Purdue and they said, good place. That's where you should go. Good. And uh, so we came and uh, actually worked on a PhD here. Where did you live when you came here? Were you in Marin Student We Hospital? lived, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, we came here with three little girls. Oh, wow. And, um, and a wife. And we, this was before there was really the housing options we have today. I mean, students are so blessed with lots of yeah. apartments. A lot. And, yeah. A lot. Yeah. And um, we looked over at married student housing. I hope that the housing folks won't be watching wow. this video at some point in time, but they, they were nice. Married student housing was nice, but it was just in, too small. So we yeah, stayed. Yeah, with three children. That with was, three kids. That was so we stayed in Village Manor up off of 52. Soldiers Home Road, 52. Right, right. And we were in a condo townhouse kind of uh, uh, apartment. And it was our first experience as a family living in an apartment with children. And um, it was a real adventure. How old were your children at the time? Uh, elementary school. Oh, okay. Uh, all the girls were in elementary school at the time. <clears throat> they went to Cumberland. Which was close. It was very close, right. very convenient. And um, David Moses... I'm not sure where David is now. But he's still living. He's retired. He's he still retired. lives in the same house out there. David Moses was kind enough to provide a job opportunity for Donna in the undergraduate library. And uh, so the while I was a Ph.D. student and on a fellowship, uh, we supplemented our income with Donna working in the library, and that was really a very good. That was really a a, a blessing. And so. Um, uh, really had no thought that at the completion of the Ph.D. that you would stay here. We uh, came fully and in, fully intending that, you know, once we finished the Ph.D., we would go somewhere else and start a career. And um, about the time that I finished in the College of Technology, there was a, an opportunity for us to stay as an assistant professor and, and actually teach in the area that I had been doing my research, which is in the area of quality assurance and quality improvement. And, um, and so um, we made the decision to stay. And uh, thus began you know, a career as a professor at the very place that I had earned a Ph.D. I gather, backing a little bit, you decided in the School of Technology, those were pro programs in that school, that, that college that you were exploring when you came for yes. your graduate work, okay? Yes, correct. Okay. okay. What do, in what department were you? I was in the Industrial Technology. Okay, okay. And so my good, there's my connection to my good friend Jim Barony. <laughs> right. understand. <laughs> so this opportunity, so you decided to take up, take it up, all right, and stay on. Yeah. All right. We did, and... Um, uh, worked our way through the ranks of, as you are familiar from, um, did it the old-fashioned way, um, did the research and the scholarship and the teaching and got promoted to associate professor and then got promoted to full professor and then had an opportunity to have my first experience in academic administration as department head. And, um, and in, so... In the department that you were in. Right. in the department that I actually earned the Ph.D. Right. And uh, so um, a, an interesting growing experience of coming as a graduate student, then becoming a colleague, and then becoming my colleague's academic department head. Um, that was, um, was an interesting journey. Uh, uh, in a rather rewarding. short, pay, short pay period of time, too. Yeah, I guess you could say sure. we, we did. I, right. I've been blessed with um, having good mentors, um, uh, opportunities that came along at the right time, 
and you'd like to think that maybe some hard work and help it all it all falls it into it falls into right, it yeah. falls into place and um, and a tremendous love for Purdue University and the college. Sure. So uh, right. How large was the department at that time? How large was the yeah. department? Was probably about three hundred undergraduate students. I'm going to guess we maybe had. 35 or 40 graduate students, so about 10 percent of our student body would sure. have been graduate students. Um, oh gee, I wish I could tell you how many faculty in the department, yeah. 10, 12, something like right. that. That sounds like, yeah. having been here about that yeah. time, that sounds right. But then moving on, then there was a little bit of a, oh, Vision 21, you were also the director of the grad studies, yeah. graduate studies, and then Vision <coughs> 21 you were involved in too. Yeah, the. Um, 1997-98, um, Robert Ringel uh, and Steve Bering uh, created this thing called uh, Vision 21, and uh, it was a continuous improvement, quality improvement yeah, initiative that they actually began with a partnership with Motorola. And um, Bob asked me to, to lead that effort. Uh, out of the provost's office, and uh, I did that for three years, and that was really a great experience. Uh, um, you got contact with the with the whole university, you, which is great. You do, yeah, right. Catherine. You, in, in your work, you you get you sure. have a chance to see the university from a very broad perspective. Sometimes in an academic department, you can really get so focused on right. what you're doing day to day with within your own academic unit that you don't see. You other don't have an opportunity. Taking. That's you right. Don't. That's right. And, and that three-year period really allowed that to happen. I had a chance to see the university from a very different set of lenses and um, meet a lot of people and understand the richness of Purdue and this mosaic right. that we have here that, that um, I hadn't seen before. And I think Bob, too, maybe saw that as a growing opportunity for me. And, um, and as a result of all of that, I ended up uh, having an opportunity to go over to the graduate school and serve as an assistant dean of the graduate school for actually just one year. Um, but that was a good, another opportunity that came along. Again, see good. the university from a very sure. uh, broad perspective. Um, but also, by going to the graduate school, it presented an opportunity to leave Purdue. And uh, that was... Um, that was a tough decision. Yeah, you saw that in the topics. What, what made you, what, what, how did that transpire? What, that's, how, that's a really good question. Um, it, led to another, it led to something else, it the did. opportunity, right. It did. Um, and, and that's and, and amazing as you chart your life and your career, uh, or for me anyway, uh, it, it happens in these increments of time. You know, you have four or five years this happened, and then four or five years this happened. And, and um, that's a good point, and you, others experience the same thing. It comes in segments like that. Yeah, it you comes know, in, in segments. Blocks. It's not nicely, neatly packaged up, right. and, but you can begin to see threads tying it together. And you look back and you say, "Oh, that." As you look to back, this. you realize you it even more. That's right, exactly. Not right. while you're on the journey, maybe, but when you look back, you say, "Oh, yeah, I see where that led to this, and that experience helped prepare me for this." And and uh, we'd been at Purdue. Um, about 14 years, and uh, very happy. Kids had grown up here, and sure. um, Donna was very happy here. And um, I was in that one-year appointment over in the graduate school. It was actually a three-year appointment, but I was finishing the first year of it, and really hadn't been looking to leave Purdue. That wasn't on the radar screen. And I happened to be at a conference. Uh, the fall of 1998, and ran into Dale Pounds, and it was the Engineering Technology Leadership Institute conference. Went there with Don Gentry and made a presentation, and ran into Dale Pounds, Dale, a Purdue graduate, who left and went to a university in North Carolina, Western Carolina University, and Dale was the dean of the College of Applied Sciences there. And in the College of Applied Sciences was 
engineering technology and technology, along with nursing and health sciences and some other programs. And Dell said, um, I'm, I'm going to retire at the end of this academic year. I'm stepping down as dean. And I said, really? And he said, yes. He said, you may want to look at that opportunity. I said, oh, I don't know about that. Um, we're pretty happy at Purdue. He said, yeah, you, you should look at it. And um, anyway, long story short, we did look at the opportunity. It's the only place that year, in fact, it's the only place in several years that I ever really looked at seriously enough to go interview. And I went down and Donna went with me and went on the interview and um, the folks at Western Carolina University were just absolutely lovely. And, it's in a beautiful part of the country. I don't know if you've ever been there or not before, mm -hmm. but it's near Asheville. It's That's like, nestled in like the mountains, great... and it's just a beautiful location. And um, the folks down there convinced us that this was a place we needed to go to. And uh, it was not an easy decision. And I remember coming back, and uh, after the interview, uh, and they called a few weeks later and said, we'd like for you to come and join us. And uh, I met with Bob Ringel, sat on a bench outside the class of 1950 building and told him about the opportunity. And I've shared it with Don Gentry because he was one of my references and he too encouraged me to look at it. Um, Bob said, you should go do this. He said, but I bet you come back. I said, I don't know, Bob. I, you know, this may be like uh, Thomas Wolfe in Asheville. You can't go home again. And he said, no, mark my words. You'll be back. So we left. And um, How old were your children by then? Were they in? Kimberly was, that made the decision, was a little, was tough, but maybe a little easier because Everyone was out of school with the exception of Kimberly, our youngest daughter. Mm. And I believe Kimberly was a sophomore or a junior. In high school? No, in college. No, in college. Yeah, oh, and the others had been finished. She was a, a, a consumer family science student. She majored in early childhood education. And she was, I believe, a junior because we came back, I believe it was the, it was either the winter commencement of, or fall commencement of um, 2000, I believe it was. In fact, it was. And um, she graduated. So she was still here. And um, that was a little difficult for mom and dad, but it, it, it worked out okay. Oh, sure. It was fine. She was, you know, a young woman, and she didn't need mom and dad doting over anyway. But... Um, so uh, we headed off for Carolina, huh? We headed off for the Carolinas and had a spectacular time. <clears throat> Learned a lot there because half the college that I was responsible for as dean was uh, health-related. Physical therapy, nursing, allied health, health sciences. And um, the other part of the college had criminal justice and Kind of a uh, cross of the social sciences and the medical yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, Interesting. it was. Uh, um, the university was actually divided up into four colleges, and this was one of the four. Mm. And what had happened in the past, prior to my arrival, uh, they had taken two small schools and merged them into one college. And um, but what made it really uh, uh, an interesting experience for me because I'm not a life scientist. So. Well, like Jim Barney, I, it doesn't rust. I don't know much about it. And, um, <laughs> but so I wasn't a life scientist. So I was put into a situation where I had to learn a lot about the issues around health care. And I had a chance to serve on a hospital board and uh, on an editorial board for a local newspaper in Asheville, which was a new experience for me altogether. And um, so you, again, you, you look back and you say, well, gee, that was an opportunity to grow and learn some new things, that, right. that some experiences that I probably would have not had had I remained 
you know, right. where I was. And so, uh, so there's something to be said, I guess, for kind of venturing out and taking some risks. And, and when we made that move, we lost a little sleep over because I thought, well, this is risky business. You know, we're, you know, I'm leaving something that I have known and understood and been very comfortable with for 14 years to go to something that was, you know, a very unknown. Um, to some extent. To some extent, right. yeah. And, but what was really exciting too about it, there's the upside of you meet new people, that it's a new experience, um, um, different part of the country, and um, that was fun. Uh, that was fun. We, uh, we had a great time, and um, it put us a little closer to our family. Uh, which was just across the mountain in East Tennessee, and uh, that was good because it allowed us to spend some, some time. additional time sure. there that we wouldn't have. And um, I grew up um, in a very female-dominated world. The men were off doing other things, and one of the most prominent people in my life was a grandmother. And I've often thought that uh, life or destiny allowed me to go back for that three-year period of time because I was able to spend those three years, which were her last three years, alive. She died at age 91, and, uh, and I was able to be by her bedside when she passed away, and that meant a lot so to lot. me. Yeah. That may not have happened had we not been that close. made that move. Right. Um, so, yeah, it was, um, it was a good experience. It was a great experience for Donna. And met a lot of good people, made a lot of new friends. And good contacts. Oh, yes. All right. Yes, absolutely. And now we turn to, you return to the school, to Boomerang the college. Boomerang back. All right. Um, <clears throat> which was the Bob Ringel prediction, which I thought would never happen. I, was Bob still, had, uh, or was he back in audiology when you came back? He had just moved back into audiology. Sally Mason was the provost. That's so right. Okay. Very Because you came back in, what, 2002? Was that 2002. All right. 2002. Actually, when I left um, to go to Western Carolina, I really thought I was on a different career path. I thought, you know, be a dean and I'd move on to be a provost somewhere. And coming back and being a dean the second time just, just wasn't even on my radar screen. Sure, I understand. And, uh, and it was the fall of 2001 when um, the search committee first called. I'm, I knew Don Gentry had moved over into the new position of vice provost for engagement. And so, you know, you, the circles you travel and you know people move on and vacancies occur. and. And you know, you, you, I probably thought about, well, boy, that would be interesting going back, but I never contacted anyone here. I knew the search committee was being formed, and, and uh, finally a, a member of the search committee called me and said, would you be interested in this? And I said, probably not. I'm not sure it would be good for the college or for me to, again, can you go home again? And, and uh <coughs> Is this the right thing to do? And, and the search continued on until November. And I'll always remember, this is, this I remember. Uh, being in uh, Cullowee, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, it's in the evening. And we'd already had a half a dozen calls from different members of the search committee and the answer was always I'm very happy where we are and we're on a little different trajectory and this is probably not the right thing to do and um, in fact a couple of them had called Donna and said you know we'd really like for you the two of you to think about this and um, of course the kids were all gone from here so we really didn't have any sure. you know, family ties here so um, but that Wednesday evening, Vic Lechtenberg called, and Vic was chairing the search committee. And I have just tremendous respect and admiration for Vic. He's a 
very wise man and and uh, someone whose opinion I value greatly. Okay. And Vic called and he said, uh, Dennis, the search committee, your name keeps coming up and we'd like for you to think about considering this opportunity. And, and, uh, and I, he said, Purdue is a very different place today than probably when you left it because Martin Jiske was president and Sally Mason is the new provost. And I said, okay, Vic, uh, tell me specifically how is it different, you know. I was there for 14 years. I know a little something about Purdue, but if it's all that different, explain that to me. Help me understand that. And not in, I didn't mean that in a cynical way either. And I listened to Vic for about 30 minutes and hung up the telephone and talked it over with Donna. We had a conversation about it. And by the weekend, we had decided that we would at least submit a resume and uh, a Vita and a letter of application and then see where it goes. I mean, and we were being very philosophical about it, that if we submitted it and didn't hear from anyone, that was okay. Sure. And I think it was probably early December before I ever got it all packaged up and sent in. And, and it was kind of interesting because I doubt that I had more than maybe a week and a half or two weeks lapsed from the time I mailed it in. And I got a call from Vic and said, uh, uh, someone from here will be working with you. We need, you're one of the three or four finalists and uh, we'd like to invite you to campus for the full interview and uh, I, uh, here are some dates and begin thinking about it. And I remember hanging up the telephone and being in a bit, a bit of shock, thinking, okay, now, now what am I going to do? And... Um, Anyway, we came back and it was a cold, snowy day in February and, and uh, we uh, were warmly received by our Purdue family and friends and uh, I did my uh, open forum that you have to do when you compete for one of these jobs. And, uh, in fact, I think it was in Fowler Hall and uh, the... Um, felt like a homecoming almost. I mean, because you know, I'd only been away three years, so I knew a lot of the folks sure. that were there, and their friends and colleagues, and a few new faces. But sure. uh, uh, So it was a very warm reception, a very warm greeting, and, and uh, oh, maybe two weeks or so after I was here, I got the call from Sally Mason, and Sally actually flew down to Asheville and spent the day with me and then made the offer. And, uh, and I came back. Long story short, yeah, here good. we are again. <laughs> oh, some of the highlights, you know, some of the changes and working with the students and things since you've taken over and uh, oh. initiatives. You've got your strategic plan that's Going. I'll let you just make some general observations. Well, okay. we, we, we finished the first strategic plan. You know, right. We, we, we uh, crafted the first one uh, that we just finished the uh, year Martin retired. Um, we are now in the process of uh, putting the, uh, we're in the final phase of uh, strategic plan two, which will be the plan that will be put in place under uh, Dr. Cordova's uh, administration. So um, the strategic planning process uh, this time has been a little different than the first time we crafted the strategic plan. You know, the strategic plan uh, when Martin was president, when I came back, he was already here and he had already launched, he, he was launching his strategic plan the summer we came. Right. And so our job was to align the college's strategic plan with the president's. And we built that plan around uh, four fundamental priorities. One was hiring and retaining outstanding faculty and staff because we were ramping up with the strategic planning hires. Now the second one was um, priority was working on continuing to develop relevant curricula for our undergraduate 
and graduate programs. Third was uh, to continue to grow our scholarship and sponsored research. And the fourth is, no surprise to anyone, was raise a lot of money. And we were in the capital campaign. And so if you go back and look at that strategic plan, all of the goals, all the metrics, uh, all the priorities kind of aligned together uh, around the four priorities that I just mentioned. So um, we have also this time identified signature areas and signature areas being recognizing that you can't be all things to all people. And I think that's been a real hallmark of Purdue. We, we don't try to be everything. Okay. But you can bet that whatever Purdue sets out to do, they're going to do it the first best class, way. Right. the best. And so we we start identifying signature areas: advanced manufacturing, life sciences, because we really hadn't done much in life sciences up until five or six years ago. So now we're into biometrics, and uh, we're doing things with uh, biomedical engineering technology and things of that nature that we just weren't doing before. Forensics and security being one, STEM, science, technology, engineering, mm -hmm. mathematics. And so we, we, we develop signature areas and, and the signature areas being the way in which we would make decisions. You know, we would make decisions based on these are our priorities, these are our signature areas, this is where we're going to put our resources. Right. And um, this strategic plan is a little different in that um, it's been more broadly crafted in terms of participation. So where in the, the first round, there's some faculty input, but it, was, it happened pretty fast and we already knew what the priorities were and what we needed to focus on. This time we've had a little more time with, with, with Frances present. You know, she took a bit of a bottoms up approach to strategic planning. And we've done the same thing. Um, so it's been broader participation, um, but still trying to condense it down to focus on you know some very specific goals right. and objectives. Um, of course, now as we go into this budget cycle that everyone's talking about, that uh, you all we all know that every time you create a strategic plan, you have to link it with resources. I mean, how you gonna pay for it? Right. So. We're now in the process of trying to link financial resources to the strategic plan. That probably will not be finished until, I'm going to guess March, sure. early April of next year. Um, and it could be influenced greatly by what happens with this biennial budget too. And probably will. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, right, yeah. Um, let's see, fundraising, you already addressed that and that's kind of key. What about diversity? Diversity. <clears throat> One of our goals early on in 2002 was, Catherine, when I came on board as dean, I think there were only three or four women faculty members in the college. When you came back as dean? Yeah. There were three or four women in the college who were on the faculty. There was not a, a minority, an African American on the faculty at all. And um, the first thing we did is I went out and recruited two associate deans. Um, uh, one was Melissa Dark, who was working over in Sirius and uh, had developed a real reputation in security and uh, computer security. And uh, she came on board as the assistant dean for strategic planning and research. And, uh, and Mary Sadowski, who was at Arizona State University. And uh, Mary had been here before herself and left. And brought her back as the associate dean for undergraduate programs. That represented Catherine, the first time in the history of our college of uh, 40 plus years that there was a female dean in the college. 
And um, part of our, the priority of recruiting outstanding faculty and staff, when that unfolded, one was to make sure that we added some diversity there. We really didn't feel like we could do much with, we felt like if we were going to attract young women and minorities to our programs, it would be nice if they could see women and minority faculty members and staff. So we went from almost ground zero to uh, today in the college, we probably have about 44, 45 women or minorities or both in the College of Technology. So we changed the picture of the faculty. It looks diverse. And when we realized that we had really accomplished something, Mary Sadowski made this comment once, so we had to put together a task force. And we wanted the task force to be faculty and some staff. And we put together a task force from the faculty and staff in the college, called a meeting, went to room 202, and Mary looked around at me and she said, Dennis, do you realize, look at the, look at the people around the table. We crafted a task force and we did not have to work at building diversity into it. It happened automatically. It was automatically there. That's great. And, um, but we still have, with that said, we still have a long, long way to go. Like the College of Engineering, we don't do well with young women. Uh, we don't do well in some areas with uh, minorities. And so we, we, with Mary's help, and with the help of some of our corporate sponsors, right. Right. and Tony Mangia, we are putting together and have for the last three or four years programs that take place during the year as well as during the summer to try to attract more young women or minorities to these technical disciplines. And that's really, really one of the reasons that STEM is one of our right. targeted signature areas. It follows. Um, is to try to try to find ways, and we've, done, we've been very proud. Alka Harriger in Computer and Information Technology last year was awarded about a $1.2 or $3 million NSF grant. In Computer and Information Technology, not very many young women. And the goal of this grant is to build summer enrichment programs over a three or four year period of time, targeting middle schoolers to try to attract more young women to these computing disciplines. And uh, so while we've made progress from where we would have been in 1970 or 1980, right. we still have a long, long way to go. Right. It's an ongoing thing, and that, oh, that is. And you, progress is being made. Let me ask you this, this the, for the research, statewide technology program mm -hmm. and the TAP and the technical assistance, uh, make a couple comments on that. There's, there, is, there is a difference. There is a difference. TAP is the technical assistance program that's housed here on campus to, to provide um, access to faculty talent to small companies in the state of Indiana to solve particular technical or engineering problems. And a whole host of faculty from science, engineering, agriculture, technology, management are involved in, in that program. Um, it's very different than statewide technology. It's similar in that it's a line item funded by the state of Indiana. Right. Statewide technology is a unique educational delivery system that comes out of Purdue University that serves the citizens of the state at 10 different locations. South Bend, New Albany, Kokomo, Richmond, Columbus. So we, we offer degree programs at 10 different locations around the state. Okay. These degree programs are taught by Purdue faculty, some of whom live right in those communities. Uh, they're hired by the faculty here in West Lafayette. The degree programs are accredited and approved by the faculty here in West Lafayette, but delivered at that other location. 
Um, we serve about 1,400 students a year in that program. And these are typically individuals who, for a number of reasons, can't come to West Lafayette. Family, job, work circumstances, um, financial circumstances. Um, but it provides them the opportunity to earn a Purdue degree at a place as far away as New Albany or South Bend. Um, it is funded uh, by the state as a line item. It's, we've had great state support for this program. And of course, part of the budget is the tuition the students pay uh, for the classes they take. Uh, it's a partnership with um, other universities. We could not do this without our colleagues in Bloomington, IU. So we, in many cases, are on an IU campus, Southeast, Kokomo, South Bend, Richmond. Uh, so students will take their math and science and English as an IU course. In Anderson, Indiana, it's with Anderson University. So it's a tremendous partnership and a way of leveraging taxpayer dollars and resources uh, very, very, very well. About 98% of the graduates of these programs are always worried about the brain drain. They stay in Indiana. And you hear some amazing stories. Uh, one I'll share, and there are hundreds of them. A young mother uh, in her late 30s finishing a mechanical engineering technology degree in New Albany. Two children couldn't come to West Lafayette, worked at a local manufacturing plant, earning her degree there, her Purdue degree, enabled her to gain a promotion, improved her economic status, and I listened to her share that story at a commencement, because we go to those locations and do commencements. It may only be 40 students, 40 graduates, but we We're do there. the commencements there. And uh, she shared the story about how grateful she was that the degree program was there because had it not been, she would have never earned a Purdue degree, couldn't have advanced in the company she worked for. But the part that touched me as a dad was her, was her testimony about how her expectations for two little children at home had changed. Mom's expectations were different. And uh, so it changes lives. And you really sometimes wonder that compounding effect. You have 1,400 people who graduate, and we have four or 5,000 alums out there. But what's the economic impact? Uh, what's the societal impact? What impact has it had on other generations? Um, which is key to it, and it's nice to find that and to learn that and find that out. It'd be nice to know that. That's right. And That's a good uh, point. Yeah. The technical assistance course, they have a lot of sites, too. Oh, they're everywhere. And, they, and they, they've they're, expanded they're, over this over oh, they time, have. right? Yes. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, your chairing the university search committee at the moment. Oh, yeah. For, for the researchers, just a, uh, I was thinking of some researchers yeah. when they pick on, just sort of a little bit on the process that uh, I know you go through, you uh, address this when you, uh, you were invited to um, send in your Vita, but just sort of a little bit, just some general comments on it. About the search process? Yeah, right. Search process for deans at Purdue. Our history has been uh, the chairs of search committees for deans usually is chaired by a dean. Uh, so it's, it will, you have to take your turn doing this. And uh, this is the second time for me. I did it for the College of Pharmacy, Nursing, and Health Sciences, Craig Svensson. And I'm now doing it for the College of Education. It's really a lot of, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Um, but you do have the opportunity, once again, to interact with colleagues in a different college in a little different way. And um, I think that uh, all, all, all hires are important hires, but certainly I think 
making good hires at the dean's level is important because faculty, they take that very seriously, just as they would a department head. And right. um, so this has been an interesting journey of trying to make sure that you are at a place like Purdue looking at the best talent across the country and recruiting for a faculty in the College of Education or in pharmacy, nursing, and health sciences. Uh, um, a dean candidate that will serve them well, right. number one. Number two, a dean candidate that will serve Purdue well, because you're not just the dean of a college, you're part of this big academic community. And you know, you, you want to hire a dean that will be a colleague for you too. You right. know, so you're hiring a colleague in this process. So. Um, it's been interesting, and it's been interesting to watch the dynamics of the search committee, and and it works amazingly. Uh, it, it actually it's a process that works very very well. Uh, uh, we are in, and are just about to launch. Uh, uh, in fact, our first candidate for the dean of education will be here tomorrow and Friday, and we're hoping by the fifteenth of December to have. All four in. If you watch the, if you paid attention to the news release again, diversity. Right. We have two outstanding women, and we have two outstanding. Right. Men. Yeah, I saw that. that that's right. Well, the president's council. Okay. Um, let's move down to the awards and honors. Any special ones that you'd like to highlight? For me, mm -hmm. perhaps the one that's the most meaningful for me as a faculty member would be um, uh, the receiving of the Dwyer Award. The Dwyer Award is a teaching award in the College of Technology that is awarded each year to an outstanding classroom teacher. It's decided on by students. Students make the selection, not your peers. That one I value greatly. Yeah, that's very nice. Um, favorite Purdue tradition? And commencement. Okay, sounds good. Commencement. You, Others have say, shared that. Why I say commencement right. is if you've been if you've worked at some other universities before. Commencement at Purdue is an incredibly special moment. Um, and it's special whether you're the student, you're in the faculty ranks, or if you're up on the stage as the dean, but commencement. Right. How about an outstanding event in your life? One of oh, those. outstanding event in my life. Um, well, besides marrying my bride, um, the love of my life, Donna, Probably um, birth your children. If it was a Purdue event, outstanding event, it would be um, of all events, even being selected as dean. Probably uh, walking across the stage of the Elliott Hall of Music and being hooded with the hood of the doctorate. Um, I have degrees from two from another institution, but. I bleed black and gold. And, uh, <laughs> Sounds good. Any uh, closing comments that you'd like to share with us? Mm. Um, no, this, other than being part of this university and and uh, and the college has been just uh, the most important part of my professional life, and it's been very rewarding. It's given uh, more back to me than I've given to it at times. Uh, I feel incredibly blessed. Uh, uh, I'm a blessed man uh, in many, many ways to have good friends, good colleagues, to know a Catherine Marquis and a Jim <laughs> Barony, and to have been able to travel this journey at a place like Purdue. I'm blessed. Good. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Dr. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. <laughs>